David Ryan Daigle from Ragley, Louisiana. I grow cattle, timber, kids, and lots of other special plants and animals on Longleaf Pine Savannas, Southwest Louisiana. Prairie is a French word for grassland. Use the world over. <laughs> Savannah is a grassland with trees on it, so we call it Longleaf Savannah. So this is a prairie with trees on it. So we're really managing two habitats. The two major forces, the two major management inputs that we have are uh, fire and, uh, and herbivory. Fire on a uh, every other year to every third year basis to keep the brush species down. But we also do what we call targeted grazing. It's with a rotation, rotational grazing, where we allow the, the grasslands to rest and regrow for perpetuation and for higher forage production through the year. We're, we're, we're very focused on, on the grassland, and then we're gonna talk a lot about how we manage the forest portion of the thing. We manage seven longleaf tracks within this Western Gulf Coast Flatwoods eco-region of Southwest Louisiana. About 10 years ago, we kind of went stale. We thought we knew everything that we could ever know about managing this system. And like all things in nature and science, we'll never know it all. It's just our, our attempt to know the truth. We begin to see quite a few articles about the importance of the health of the ecosystem below the ground. You know, what none of us ever look at because we look at everything from the ground surface up. And I got really interested in it really, really quickly. So it's like we started looking at things a little differently is that how do we burn and how do we graze to make sure that our soil health stays in a, in a positive mode. Our commercial crops are timber and cattle. We're basically harvesting sunlight energy uh, for trees and grass and cattle. So this is a 40 foot pole, four marks on it but we place also a high value on the species diversity and the habitat maintenance uh, for the long haul on these tracks. But our experience over 37 years is that we can keep our grasslands open here, our savanna, our prairie with trees on it, with fire and grazing used in, in the right ways. Most prairies in the world were formed and managed and maintained over time with fire and herbivory. In our case, grazing maintains the herbaceous layer, keeps this area from growing up into a brushland, basically. They, they, they graze here through filtered shade. These are all warm season grasses and forbs. So our production is in the summertime, primarily. It's cow-calf operation. We sell calves in the spring and then we also sell them in the fall. The longleaf pine savannas here grow between 3,000 and 3,500 pounds of air dry forage per acre per year. Uh, of course, burning cycles nutrients and, uh, it, and you know, it's kind of like a short-term fertilization and liming after the fires. Longleaf pines have a very thin overstory uh, in the crowns and you can see blue sky through the crown of every longleaf. This is the grazing of a natural forest, but it, but it, you know, it does produce agriculture products. We find ourselves uh, at stocking rates of a cow per 10 acres to a cow per 20 acres. Yeah, we give 10 acres to the cow, but we're growing trees at the same time. Our focus is keeping our fossil fuel inputs and our total cost inputs low. And our variable cost per cow is, is probably about as low as we can get it. So wow. that's what we do. <laughs> so it's the free and easy way to grow cattle in timber. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fire ecologists tell us that, you know, the whole southeastern U.S., you know, the marshlands along the Gulf were dependent on fire historically before the Native Americans got here. 12, 15,000 years ago. It was burned in any way with lightning strike fires, naturally. No doubt the Native Americans influenced the fire tremendously. They used fire to herd and move animals and to hunt. 
uh, we believe that they knew that they were maintaining a really nice place to live. They could move around, they could produce their red meat. Hi, my name is Cece Richmond, and I am a private lands biologist with Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. When you first arrive here, you instantly notice that it's different than most of our piney woods around here. Behind me is a longleaf pine savanna habitat. These are, in fact, critically imperiled habitats. Critically imperiled means there's not very many um, good examples of the habitat left uh, with an intact plant community. So many of our Piney Woods areas are so overgrown with underbrush, suddenly you just have this beautiful open vistas that you can see. So that tells you, you know, as a biologist, I know this is what our historic longleaf ecosystems look like. So I know what he's doing is correct. This particular track was burned in February of this year, a few months back and uh, it's growing some good grass. We've had a pretty good sized herd of cattle in here for about three weeks now. So they've really filled up on this lush, nutritious grass. How he's doing it is using the same forces of nature that would have historically shaped our landscapes. And that is fire and her herbivory. Um, of course, we didn't have cows here historically, but buffalo did used to come down and migrate through these areas. For us, it's not so much about guarding the museum, so to speak, here, but it's more like managing a living, functional ecosystem. And when you do that, you produce products uh, that are sellable and you know that are, that are good for us as the landowner and good for society in general. We are going to look at a, uh, a longleaf savanna where we have timber marked for tree harvest. And uh, we're going to sell some timber and produce some income. Profitability is part of the long term um, sustainability and continuance of these sites. And that timber is going to be in the form of poles for utility poles, which is a high high value product and logs for making lumber and plywood and those kind of things. So, Well, what we're doing here is managing a longleaf pine forest for long-term perpetuation. So we're using two techniques to do that. One is um, single tree selection, which means we'll come through this forest and select certain trees for specific products. So to maximize the income that'll come from it and the value, this tree will be a utility pole. So those are the two highest value forest products that are here on a commercial basis. It's a win-win kind of thing. We'll improve our forest, call it timber stand improvement, and we'll produce some, uh, some timber as well, uh, some, some income. But when we combine everything together with the, with the cattle and the timber production as the, as the ag production comes, it, it works pretty well. We get a good return on our, on our property than uh, just any single use we feel like. This is a unique ecosystem and that it, in the North America, it's going to be one of your most diverse ecosystems that you can find. If you want to maximize the productivity of a natural system, you think about what can I do for, that elevates my ecosystem processes in this system? So there's three ecosystem processes, one being energy flow, the amount of sunlight that flows through the system in a year, the water cycle, how much water is cycled, you know, and reused right here on site, and then the mineral cycle, what are the minerals doing? So if you graze a grass the way we just talked about, you're gonna maximize those three ecosystem function processes. This is important because the high diversity supports a high um, diversity of insect species and of other wildlife. Consumptive wildlife, uh, we do very well with white-tailed deer and uh, eastern wild turkeys are doing well. Hi, my name's Tom Sullivan and I work for the National Wild Turkey Federation. Turkeys, they, you know, if it's if it's not burned within two to three years or open, you know, they will move on. And with grazing cattle, you know, that's your, that's your habitat modifier right there. 
So consumptive wildlife is a big, big value to us. Non-consumptive is also a, a, great, uh, a great value. Um, I'm really a plant nerd. I get excited when I see the diversity of plants. The little plants down in, in the grassy layer, the wildflowers that you don't see every day. We also have uh, one federally endangered American chafe seed on one of our tracks, which we also manage for as well. When you see these different plants, when I see something I don't recognize, then that's when, um, you know, I sort of get excited because that means this isn't just an everyday site. You know, it's something special. And this site definitely is special. I've been out here with one of our botanists before and he was very excited because he just saw a huge diversity of species that um, some of which haven't been collected in this parish before potentially. We're standing here close to uh, some red cockaded woodpecker inserts where we've uh, we managed our forest and, and, uh, and installed some inserts to attract uh, red cockaded woodpeckers to come into this area. Right now, a lot of the trees around us are not big enough for the uh, red cockaded woodpecker, but as these trees reach the proper size, will be perfect for the red cockaded woodpecker because it needs a nice open system, high insect diversity, because that's what it uses as a food resource. So through his management, he's providing habitat that is not readily available. It's what our whole landscape looked like historically, and yet we only have these little pockets of it left. And so a lot of their populations are declining, and without them, you know, we could potentially lose these species in the future. Like any kind of agriculture operation, um, you got to do the right things at the right time. So we have an A herd, a B herd, a C herd, and a D herd. Each of four sites has a distinct herd that's permanently there at that site. And they manage that track, they stay there. So we rotate the cattle through these different rangelands. So we keep the grasses in a growthy stage so that the cows only utilize about maybe, um, maybe a third or a half of the top growth. So we want the cow to take the third of the top off. So if this is the whole plant, we want those cows to come through and take this off and go somewhere else and let this regrow. And it turns out that the top one third of this grass is the most nutritious part of the grass. One of the things that enhances soil health is species diversity. If you look at the root systems that are here, Underground, you're going to see uh, that all the all the spaces are taken by by the various plants. Some plants are deep rooted, some are shallow rooted. So, uh, but we know that species diversity is very very important with uh, for uh, for soil health. Very very important that our cattle will perform here well, and just any old cow genetics won't make it here. So we have genetics mixed into our cattle from our old historic cattle, really tough, really hardy. We kind of run them kind of like a wild animal. So work with nature, not against it. Work with nature, not against it. Historically, before Columbus came to America, this is maybe what you had, and then if we if we do disturbances or if we don't manage correctly, this may di diminish to some degree in health. One of the things we learned here was that the influence of the cattle on the herbaceous layer has the largest Im impact on improving soil health here. Soil health has a tremendous impact on the herbaceous layer and the total production of a site on a grassland. Tracks that we weren't grazing on were becoming encroached with too much uh, brush vegetation where we were losing our grassland. Even though we were burning, we were top killing our, um, our, our brush species, but they were spreading at the bottom. So we were losing our grassland and our coverage of our grasses and forbs. It's, it's a opportunity to almost look back in time as to what this ecosystem should look like because it has been preserved. And there's not a lot of healthy longleaf understory ecosystems that we can find. So uh, we're basically just using a natural system 
to produce agriculture products, cattle and timber. But then we have the ecological values that we really think about. You know, you know, very important that we don't change this plant community. It's fine like it is, and in fact, it's a critically imperiled habitat. So it produces for us. We don't overuse the system. We don't abuse the system. We just work with nature rather than against it, or we work with nature and what nature provides. So this is a grazing land. This is very much a grazing land. It was, you know, we know that it was, it was, uh, it was maintained by the Native Americans with fire. We know there were red meat animals on this system uh, that they hunted and managed. And, uh, and so in, in very much we're continuing to do um, that same kind of work here as well.